The Apostle John says, No one has seen God at any time. And yet we know God appeared to men in the Old Testament. So how can this be? Well, our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, tells us, since the world in general is not seeing Jesus as he is presented in the Word of God, the only way it will know of God's love is through the lives of believers who represent him. We're in for a great study in the book of 1 John today on Through the Bible. So as you open your copy of God's Word to 1 John 4, verse 12, Dr. McGee has some encouraging remarks about our stockholders. You didn't know that we have stockholders? Well, Dr. McGee explains as he reads this letter now. It says, no matter what others say, keep reading those letters. You could consider me as being a stockholder in your program. In the business world, a stockholder gets an annual report on the company. The letters that you read over the air are my stockholders report and it is given daily in church meetings or crusades etc you can more or less see the results the letters show the results of not what you do but what the word of god can do and i'd like to add to that and it does do it by the way Well, for all of you stockholders and everyone else who loves to hear what God is doing around our country and around the world, here's today's report. This is a letter from La Cunada, California. In December 2011, I found Dr. McGee led by the Lord on KKLA. His study in Hebrews came to me in the darkest hour of my life since my husband died eight years ago, leaving me with a six-month-old, four-year-old, and eight-year-old boys. I was uplifted, encouraged, and blessed through his biblical guidance that gave me great hope. A few days after listening to him, I was moved to begin tithing again. Then within a few days after that, I was strongly impressed to give a portion of that tithe to TTB. Without Dr. McGee's ongoing guidance, I am convinced I would have been mired in pain and away from hope. It is a great source of solace and with wonderful anticipation that I look forward to the next five years of study. I keep you in my daily prayers in gratitude and lifting up in blessings. Well, isn't it amazing how God cares for us in our time of greatest need? This next letter comes to us from a listener in Lakeland, Florida. You have truly opened my heart to the love and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The inspiring words have brought me back into the fold. I had reached the point of straying, but the Bible teachings of Dr. McGee reached into my heart and brought me back home. Your insight and simple, thought-provoking language stays with me and brings me closer to our Jesus, our Savior, day by day. We're so grateful that God in love and mercy seeks us and then welcomes us back home. Let's thank him now. Heavenly Father, thank you for welcoming us back home through your son, Jesus Christ, who bought us with his own very precious blood. Your grace, Lord, overwhelms us. So help us to understand your word as we study together today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we come back today to 1 John, the fourth chapter and we are putting in today at verse 12. We are moving very slowly for the very simple reason that we believe that this just happens to be very important at this time. So many pastors have said to me that this book that I taught first in my church is a book they want to teach in their church because it is a book that is meaningful to believers today. Now he opens this by saying, no man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us, or perfected, however you want to pronounce it. Now, no man has seen God at any time. Well, that's a statement that will be challenged because I've had several letters of people when I made this statement before that no one had seen God, they began to give me scriptural illustrations of those that have seen God. They began, of course, with Adam, and they tell me about him and that Moses talked with God face to face and that God put him in the cleft of the rock and went by 
And then in Isaiah, the sixth chapter, Isaiah it tells about going into the temple, and he says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his glory filled the temple. And yet we find Ezekiel had visions of God, and the Lord appeared to Daniel, and there are others that we could give. And yet we can say, as John said in his gospel, John 1, 18, no man hath seen God at any time. But that doesn't conclude that statement. But the only begotten of the Father, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. That is, he's exegeted him. Now, that just simply means this, that when God appeared to man in the Old Testament, they did not see God, for God is a spirit. And that's the way that you worship him. They saw what is known as a theophany. That is, that God manifested himself in some form to these men, but he did not manifest himself in all of his fullness, so that it can be said, and John is saying it now in his epistle, even after the Lord Jesus Christ has gone back to heaven, he can say, no man has seen God at any time. The Lord Jesus Christ said to Philip, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. But how did you see him? Veiled in human flesh. So much so that multitudes that saw him didn't know him. And he was raised yonder in Nazareth, veiled in human flesh. They did not know that he was the Son of God. No man has seen God in all of his fullness. And that still holds good today. Now, the only way they can know about God, and the point that John is making here is just simply this, that no man has seen God at any time, but if we love one another, God dwells in us. In other words, God today can manifest himself through believers in loving one another, and the world sees that. You see, the world does not know anything about the love of God. Sinners really don't know about God's love, and God even has to show it to us on the cross when Christ died. And he did that by the Holy Spirit. That love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that's given unto us. And God commendeth his love to us that while we were sinners, while we were dead in trespasses, while we were ungodly, Christ died for us, you see. Now, that's the only way we can know about it. And it's still true. There's none that seeketh after God. So God has come down seeking man. And he came down 1,900 years ago, manifesting himself in the Lord Jesus Christ. And friends, all I know about God is what I know in the person of Christ. I don't know how God feels about certain things. I don't know what he thinks about certain things. But I can follow the Lord Jesus, and I can listen to him, and I know what God is thinking, and I can feel the heartbeat of God. I know how he feels at a funeral. Jesus wept. And he broke up every funeral he ever attended. And I know how he feels about little children. <laughs> and I know that because of the fact he came and manifested God. Now, this wicked world that you and I live in, unfortunately, too many of us are trying to please the world today instead of trying to preach to the world. We're concerned about what the world thinks of us. The important thing is, what do they think of Jesus? What do they... Think of us as we represent him today. Someone has put it like this. At the age of 20, we do not care what the world thinks of us. At 30, we worry about what the world is thinking of us. And at 40, we discover that it wasn't thinking of us at all. And that's about true. But anyway, we are today to witness to the world. And how are you going to witness? Give out the word? Yes, that's all important. But when they say, see that there's no love among believers, and the world's hungry for love. They don't know what it is. Their definition of it would be a three-letter world spelled S-E-X. That's the love that the world knows about today, but they don't know anything about the love of God. They do not know that, and they do not know how wonderful he is, and you and I don't know. No man has seen God at any time. But he can be manifested in us, you see. That's the important thing. 
It was Plato who said, and I'm of the opinion Plato came in contact with Judaism. He says the radiant light is the shadow of God. And that is a good definition. And it was David that said, thou clothest thyself with light as with a garment. And a garment is something you cover yourself with. God covers himself with light. The very thing that reveals conceals him because the light is so bright. And he is the only begotten son that is in the bosom of the father. He's led him out where we can see him. And he's the one that is God. And that's the only way you and I are going to know God today. This is very important. In fact, all important for us to know. And the thing is that the world's not seeing enough of this, and yet the world has seen it in the lives of a great many believers. Let me read on here. I'm reading verse 13. By this know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit within us. And friends, this is not a human love. You and I can't work it up. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, etc., etc. But love heads the list. And a great many believe that actually love is the fruit and these others stem from love. And if you turn to 1 Corinthians 13, read that, you'll come to the same conclusion. That joy comes out of love and that peace comes out of love. When Chiang Kai-shek was ruling in China proper, you remember he was not a Christian then, he was very much of a pagan. Whether he was a real believer or not, I don't know, but missionaries that do know it tell me that he was actually a real born-again Christian. But when he was a pagan, he had a Christian wife, you remember. He made this statement. He says, I just can't understand these Christians. Why, they've been treated most abominably here, and they've been robbed, they've been beaten, and many of them killed, and they've been persecuted in a most fearful manner. And yet I never find one of them retaliating. And any time they can do anything for China or for our people, they're ready to do it. I do not understand them. And his wife said to him, what you're seeing is the very essence of Christianity. They do that because they're Christian. And we need a great many more pagans to be able to see that in the lives of believers today. This is something that Again, I must repeat it, it's sure neglected today. How often do you hear this spoken on, either in radio or the church or wherever you are? Do you hear today, even in these little seminars we talk about and these great classes that they have, is this the thing that's given that is basic, that is all important? May I say to you, you don't have to worry about the place of the wife in the home, and whether she is to obey the husband and he the head of the house and all of that argument I hear today. If he loves her, and husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church, she's a woman that you love. You'd lay down your life for her. And the wife can say, I love him with all of my heart. I'd do anything for him. I don't think you need a lot of little rules to go by. I really don't think you need to. I know there's a monument. I used to see it. It's out in either Kansas or Colorado, coming along on the Santa Fe Super Chief. And I used to always watch for that monument. I even forget now the little town that it's in. But it's a monument of a pioneer woman. And that pioneer woman is in another town that I've been through, and I can't even think where that is. I do know this, that when I went through it, I didn't have my camera, and when I go through again, I'm going to take a picture of it. It's the same monument. This pioneer woman, she's got on a sunbonnet, and she's a young woman, fine-looking young woman, and she's got about five children around holding on to those long skirts that they wore back in those days. And out ahead of her, she's got a gun, too, out ahead of her, is her husband, because she's loading one gun while he shoots the other gun. And he's out there protecting her. And, you know, friends, I don't think that woman needed any lectures on sex. She's got five children. I think she could give you some lectures on it. I don't think that she needed to have a lecture on how to keep your husband. 
She had no trouble keeping him. May I say to you, you know why? Because they loved each other and they're bound together. And how wonderful that is. The child of God today, if he could only manifest the love of God to others round about us. And he says, and his love is perfected in us. In other words, it's developed in us. It is a growth in us and should be a growth in us. Verse 13, by this know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. And that, my friend, is the real test. The Holy Spirit indwells every believer. And back in verse 4, I went over that rather carefully, if you'll remember. The greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You're indwelt by the Spirit of God. Now, the Spirit of God can produce this love in your heart. You can't produce it. I can't produce it. I can't love like that. My natural hand is that when somebody hits me, I hit back. But the Spirit of God who indwells us, if we are filled by His Spirit, we're going to manifest that kind of love to the world out yonder. Now, let me read on here. Verse 14, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And this is the gospel witness, therefore. This is the message that we have to give. This is the purpose of our love. It's not something that's sloppy. And again, I have to come back and say it again. Christian love is not sentimental. It's not sexual. It's not social. It's not something that you have at the church banquet. It is something, my friend, that reveals it when we take Christ to a lost world, to sinners. That is the way we manifest our love today. It is hard to understand. I've been down with missionaries in many places. I've been with them in Israel. I've been with them in Africa. I've been with them in Lebanon. I've been with them in Turkey, although they're not allowed to be missionaries there. I've been with them in Europe, in France, and in Italy. And I want to say that I've been with them down in Mexico. I've been with them in Venezuela. I've been with them down in the Caribbean. And the thing that I note about these missionaries is this. They love people, and a lot of the people they love are very hard to love, friends. But they have a love for them. And how wonderful it is. What are they doing? They're taking a gospel out to these people. And that is the thing God's commanded them to do. And I think when they got there, they maybe didn't love them at first. But I tell you, after you've ministered to people, you'll love them. Or you just couldn't be God's child, you see. Now we move on here. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. That's where you begin with him. Don't tell me that virgin birth is not important. During the Easter week, we emphasize the gospel. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. And all of this was according to the scriptures. And friends, if he's not who he said he was, then his death and resurrection is absolutely meaningless. In fact, he was not raised from the dead. But the evidence is all on the side that he did. And the proof of it is that he was virgin born. He's who he claimed to be, that Jesus is the Son of God, and that God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And that's the reason he could say, whatever God does, I do. And he made that tremendous claim that he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, shall not come into judgment, but pass from death to life. How could that be? How is that possible, my friend? because he has made the statement before that what God does, he does, that he's going to raise the dead and he's going to judge all of the dead. That's the reason he can say to you today because of who he is, that if you hear his voice, if you'll believe on him, that you'll be saved. Now he says in verse 15, whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. Verse 16, and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Now, these are inexorably intertwined and interwoven together. You just couldn't say that you love God and that you're a child of God and hate the brethren down here. 
This is now the second time we've had the definition, God is love. And a nice way to remember this is that it's in 1 John, the fourth chapter. First, multiply four by two, and you get eight. And that's where it occurs the first time. Then multiply eight by two, and you get 16. And that's where we are right here, verse 16. 1 John 4 and 8 and 16 give the definition, God is love. Now, verse 17, herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. Now, our love is made perfect. And that, of course, means complete. That is, if you and I love God and love the Lord Jesus, and we love one another, as brethren and sisters in the faith, then that's going to give us boldness. We won't have any fear of the day of judgment at all because as he is, we're in the world. In other words, we're just like the Lord Jesus. He was raised from the dead, we are told here, and he has life. Well, we have that life too, and he's up yonder for us. We're in Christ, and we're accepted in the Beloved. And therefore, he can go on and say here, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath punishment. There's nothing like fear in the human heart, but the child of God doesn't need to fear any judgment that's coming. It's all settled when Christ died for us. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. In other words, you can't enjoy your salvation. You see, Joy does stem from love. And if you have love for the Lord Jesus, for God, and you have love for your brethren, then fear's been cast out. Verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. He loved us when we were unlovely. He's worth loving. He's worthy. The lamb is worthy of all of our love, all of our devotion, all of our service. If a man says, I love God and hateth his brother, He's a liar. I didn't say that, friends. John said that here. He says that if you say you love God and you hate your brother, you're a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? What nonsense and what pious hypocrisy there is today, even in fundamental circles. Verse 21, And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. This is a commandment. He didn't ask you whether you felt like it or whether you wanted to. He says, this is what I command you, because I love, you're to love. And that is the thing we saw in the book of Jonah. I'm a little weary, friends, of hearing about dedicated and consecrated Christians today who are lazy on the job. I happen to have quite a crew here at the Through the Bible Radio, and I watch them, and we have some wonderful, devoted workers, but every now and then, we get one, and he's generally, or she's generally the ones that talk the loudest about how dedicated they are to the Lord. You're not dedicated to the Lord unless you demonstrate it in your service today, friends. That's the only way. Until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Dr. McGee reminds us of practical, often overlooked ways that we can demonstrate God's love, first in how we love other believers and then in all other directions with relationships that we have, even by being faithful on the job. You know, we might work with people who don't yet know the Lord and maybe who have no idea about God or His love unless they see Him at work in our lives. These studies in 1 John are helping us to see things in a new light. If you want to spend more time in these studies, listen again anytime at ttb.org. And another excellent way to review these studies is by getting a copy of the complete five-year program Bible Bus Flash Drive. Not only will you get 1 John, but the audio of every lesson from Genesis to Revelation, plus all of Dr. McGee's notes and outlines, and more than a hundred of his booklets. To order this terrific resource and view the other great Bible study materials available to help you deepen your study of God's Word, go to ttb.org. And when you contact us, please tell us how you listen to Through the Bible. Is it on your favorite Christian radio station, by app, online, Alexa? Or do you use one of our resources like the Flash Drive or MP3 album? 
We really do want to know because this information helps us make good, important ministry decisions, and we want to make sure we're using the resources that God has provided through faithful listeners like you responsibly. So we hope that you'll keep in touch with us. It's really easy. You can find us online, of course, at ttb.org. You can send your email to biblebus at ttb.org. And you can always write to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Or give us a call anytime at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Tomorrow, Dr. McGee leads us in answering the question, how do I know I'm really saved? We'll be in 1 John chapter 5. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here saving you a seat on the Bible bus. Jesus made it all. All to be my own. Sin had left a crimson stain. Be washed in white as snow. We're grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners, whom God uses to take the whole word to the whole world.